Welcome to the Gentleman Project Podcast. I'm Corey Moore. And I'm Kirk Chug. Earl Foote is the CEO of Nexus IT, but on June 19th, he made a LinkedIn post that really caught my attention. We know each other from networking here in Salt Lake, but he's also a business leader that many of us listen to and respect because he's on the board of advisors for the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce, runs a huge IT firm. He's really everywhere in our business community, but he made this Facebook post about his dad on Father's Day. And it was all the things that his dad had taught him. And it was really cool to see somebody who's well-respected in our business community talk about the things that his father taught him. And I immediately reached out to Earl and said, would you come on the podcast and talk about some of these things and talk about your dad? So here he is today, uh, fulfilling that commitment when he said yes to me. So thanks, Earl, for joining us today. Hey, Corey and Kirk, it's such an honor for me to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Really, I'm, I'm deeply honored uh, to have the privilege. Let's get into just a little bit about you as a business leader and as a man. Tell us about your family, and then we'll kind of get into some of those things that your dad taught you. Is that okay? Absolutely. I am the father of um, a, a blended family of five kids. I have three biological boys that are 23, 21, and 19. And my stepchildren uh, are 27. Uh, Joseph and Valerie is just about to turn 18. Pretty much uh, five adults uh, between my <laughs> wife, Angie, and I. Uh, she's from Costa Rica. We've been married about four and a half years. Have a, a fantastic dynamic. And it's really fun to kind of have our kids that have transitioned from teenage years into adulthood. The dynamic of the family has changed in recent years. And it's been really cool. We just came back from a vacation in Costa Rica together, you know, where we spent some time on the beach and <clears throat> rented a house and, you know, had lots of really good quality time. And it's just, um, it's different, you know, we're able to just hang out, cook together, play games, you know, and, and, and um, when, when they go from kids and teenagers into adults, everything kind of shifts and changes. And sometimes the, the problems that they used to cause also change, fortunately. <laughs> so tell us a little more about that, because I think you're like right after the teenage years. I mean, I think you said it was like 18 to 24 is the range. 18 to 27. 18 yeah. to 27. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, other than a little gray in Earl's beard, you would never think that his kids would be that old because he looks like he's 30 something. No, that's true. very kind of you. <laughs> but really, but really. So talk to us a little more about that. The difference between like, what have you seen are the big differences between this adulthood conversation and being a parent during adulthood versus the teenage years that really... You just got through 10 ish years ago. Yeah. Well, and, and, and some of them just barely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, my youngest just Jeff and my, my youngest just came through it, you know, within the last year. Right. And, and then Valerie, my, um, my stepdaughter, who's literally just transitioning, she'll still be a senior in high school, but, but 18, um, in fact, in two weeks here, she turns 18, you know, uh, certainly maturity starts to play a, a pretty big role where, some of those life lessons that you've been teaching them from the time they were very small, um, whether those are simply by your actions and an example by how you live or whether they're by word, they start to resonate a little bit more, right? And I wondered if they ever would. Teenagers can, and I, I feel for parents out there, um, teenagers can be very challenging. Um, I won't sugarcoat it. Like um, my kids' teenage years um, nearly pushed me over the brink many different, you know, many times. <laughs> um, tested my patience and um, tested my resolve as, as a as a father. You're telling the parents right now, don't give up. <laughs> don't don't give up. <laughs> There's light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, I had to at some point in their teenage years, I had to just kind of come to the realization that there's no way I can obligate them to act or behave the way that I want them to. All I can do is instruct and coach and, and, you know, tell them what I think are the best decisions and then let them live their lives. Um, and that's still very, in fact, that amplifies as adults, right? Um, because they 100% have their own choices. Um, they're no longer necessarily under your roof all the time. Your, your role definitely converts more from that parent into more just a, a, a mentor per se, and as cool as that happens and they start to come to you, you know, and they start to say, hey, dad, you know, this thing is going on. And do you have any, you know, any ideas for me? You know, um, can I get some input? That's cool. And I've, I've really enjoyed that dynamic. It starts to become more rewarding. They start to realize, you know, who you are, what you've done, what you've invested in, in them, start to appreciate it more. And it becomes more visible to you. The rewards start to come back around because those teenage years can be 
again, they can be, and those rewards can be few and far between. At least in my experience, it was, you know, not that my kid, my kids are amazing, wonderful kids, right? But teenagers can be challenging. They're navigating new, new uh, life dynamics for themselves, right? Absolutely. One of the things that I often see you post about is kindness and generosity and compassion in business. How are you teaching those things to your kids now as adults? How did you teach it to them? And why is that so important in the business realm as you have all these employees who are navigating their own family situations? Yeah. First of all, um, Kirk, maybe just to back up a a step or two. um, So the the post that I made about my dad, um, my dad grew up um, in a very blue collar neighborhood in Magna, Utah. Um, The uh, the status quo was to go to work at the copper mine, right? Yeah. Um, and that's where his dad worked and all of his brothers went to work, actually. My dad um, had an opportunity, became an apprentice electrician at a company named, a local company that we all know, Wasatch Electric. Um, he was about 18 or 19 at that time and, and um, through a, a really a, you know, a 40, 45 year career, 45 year career, you know, worked his way from apprentice electrician to vice president of operations or COO of that organization for his last 10 or 12 years there. You know, my, my dad was, was a unique guy having, you know, grown up, um, with little to nothing, literally, uh, you know, having achieved some, some success in life, you know, having really, um, set out on a vision and, and become something, you know, made himself something over, over time and become a leader. I watched my dad, um, and, and forgive me if I become a little emotional. Um, I, I watched my dad, um, you know, over his, over his career, always stay true to the man he was, always stay true to the beginnings where he came from, right? I watched him always treat others with dignity, with kindness, with compassion. It didn't matter what role he was in. It didn't matter uh, his level of power per se. My dad was always humble at his core and he always valued and appreciated and loved people. Right. You know, I, I saw that from the time I was a kid and it was more something that he taught by, by the way he lived than it was that he taught by word. Um, I think, you know, we're all middle-aged gentlemen ourselves and, and our parents were, you know, part of a generation that were probably less verbose about their parenting and more just about, you know, living their lives and, and giving us, um, lessons by example, right? I, I saw that in my dad and I saw how that played a role in, in business for him um, and how it played a role in people deeply respecting my dad, how he was able to do great things in his life and career because he valued people and people valued him. I've tried to live true to that, you know, to those principles myself. I've, I've tried to also um, embody that spirit of my, of my dad in the way that I've approached, um, life and business, right? With my kids, uh, I, I would definitely say, uh, I think, you know, Corey, Corey knows the struggle. Kirk, you have, you know, your own things going on as well. You, you know, as senior executives or, or founders or CEOs, finding the right balance in business and family is always a challenge. Um, and so if I have, you know, a, a regret, it's that I've, I, I don't feel like I've always spent as much time with my kids as I, as I wanted to or should have, right? Not, not to say that I didn't. I was, you know, soccer coach, and I was there for almost all their soccer games and, you know, um, always there for important stuff and tried to, you know, be a support to them. Uh, I would say that my, my way of teaching has probably been more by example um, than it has been by, by word. Um, but we've had plenty of, you know, um, very good, deep conversations. You know, those those out of town soccer tournaments where you're driving to Vegas and back you know, every couple of weekends or, you know, Grand Junction or California or whatever, there's a lot of opportunity for, for conversations, right? Captive uh, audience in the car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that I've, I've definitely tried to help my kids understand that life is about recognizing humanity of who we are. If you can tune into that and particularly when it, when it comes to business, uh, but also, you know, very much so in life, when, when you treat other people with the humanity they deserve, because they're, they are people just like you, right? No matter where they're at in their station in life, your experience as an individual improves in life and in business, and so does theirs, right? So I, I hope that I've conveyed those lessons adequately to them. Honestly, you know, part of me being open and public is to help fill those gaps, right? I hope that at some point, 
my, my kids come back around and listen to some of these things like this podcast and they go, okay, all right, my dad taught some pretty decent things, right? And there's some things I can, I can latch on to and, and uh, learn about life. I had a question about your, you mentioned that your dad, you know, showed you by example, this idea of kindness and compassion and was the same person, you know, all the time. And you, how, where, where are the places that you saw that, right? It sounds like you actually saw it with him interacting with people at work, certainly inside your own family. Explain a little bit more about how your dad, via example, imparted or showed you this, this kindness and this compassion towards others. There, there was a gravity around my dad, no matter where he was. You know, my, my dad was a leader um, in the community as well, a leader, um, an ecclesiastical leader. It really didn't matter where we went. Everybody gravitated towards my dad. And, and they did so because, because of that spirit. It, it was palpable, I think, subconsciously perceivable that, um, that he cared deeply about people. He cared deeply about, you know, making sure that they uh, have the experience and the outcomes that, that, um, uh, that they wanted to have in life. And, and he was there as an instrument to help um, in, that, in that process. My dad's uh, service was, has always been huge to my dad. Even today, you know, at, at 82 years old and, you know, with his own struggles trying to get by, you know, in life and, and health, you know, that uh, he's, he's not the man he once was, which my dad was physically strong. He was, he was a bear. It, even today, you know, uh, my, my parents will tell us about, you know, their neighbor that's just maybe a year older than them that they're cutting the grass for or, you know, taking dinner to and that kind of stuff. That's always been a part of who they are. In fact, so much so that I would say that they've often put their own interests to the side. I would say more often than not have put their own interests to the side to make sure that others are taken care of. Whether or not that's a, an entirely sustainable practice, um, you know, uh, don't get me wrong. I think service is extremely important. I do think you have to also take care of yourself sometimes. And, um, you know, they, they were part of a different generation that sometimes I think uh, that, that was the norm that they, they would take care of others always before themselves. Corey, hopefully that's an adequate answer to that question. What was an activity that your dad did with you that you felt like drew you closer to your dad and built your relationship? So I probably owe a a great deal of my love for the outdoors to my dad. Uh, My dad was um, an avid fly fisherman that never passed on. (laughs) uh, One thing he didn't have a ton of was, was patience. Um, You know, and especially if he wanted to go fly fishing, like he wanted to go, that was his refuge. Right. And he wanted to go and tune out. And it was like at eight years old, it's like, here's a fly rod. You you flip it back and forth a few times and and I'm going to go down the river and go catch 80 fish. Right. (laughs) Um, So I I hooked my own ears, you know, far too many times and my brother's ears, you know, and and I think I just got frustrated with it at a young age. Um, But we, we always spend a lot of time on the weekends and in the summer in the outdoors, um, a lot of camping, you know, a lot of fishing, a lot of, uh, I remember winters, you know, we had a, a wood fired stove. Um, and so we would go with some other families in the neighborhood up into the Uintas, we'd get a permit and go cut down trees, you know, and, and log and bring logs home and stack them for, you know, uh, for winter so that we could stay warm as a family. Right. Th- those experiences of, Again, my dad having us as a captive audience, um, you know, for, and and our vacations were never lavish. In fact, I think, you know, throughout my childhood, um, we never had, you know, massive resources. And so uh, I remember going to Seattle once. I remember going to, um, you know, to Southern California once. And I think those were kind of the only out of state sort of uh, vacations we took. Otherwise it was camping. We'd go to the Uintas or we'd, we'd go, you know, to Southern Utah or something and go camping those times and those weeks that we would have with my dad, because we didn't have a lot of time with him outside of that work was busy. You know, his, his civic and and religious duties were, were busy, uh, you know, him displaying who he was. And then that, that graceful, um, leader that, that he always was also, he was, he was that in the family, right? Um, he, he definitely was that and still is, he's still a very poignant patriarchal figure in the family. Do you think that, what he did in showing you growing up in business and the way he went about that affected who you are today. Cause I, you know, I, I don't want to go down necessarily the business stream, but what I do like to talk about is your dad kind of had an American dream moment is what it sounds like. I mean, started as a 
from the, you know, as, as low as you can start and then worked his way to COO. Right. My dad did the same thing. He started as no one at big D and, and became eventually the CEO. Right. And so, um, there is something that you're taught as a young age. It's not that everyone needs to be an entrepreneur, but I do think that in this generation, there are people growing up that still believe that there can be an American dream happen. And there's others that don't believe that can happen anymore. Right. So what's your take on that? And, you know, did your dad do something that influenced you being an entrepreneur and doing what you've done today? Uh, absolutely. Um, and, and I would say unequivocally, uh, I, I owe very much of the man that I am to, you know, to my father, um, to the life lessons that I learned from him, you know, his example, his words, you know, I've, I've tried to emulate, you know, most of those, um, certainly we're all our own individual, you know, um, and I think, um, generations change and times change and we choose to, um, to divert some, you know, somewhat of who we are and create our own path, um, which I, I unequivocally have done and, and should do, I think on, on the life and, you know, kind of leadership side, I would say most definitely, uh, you know, seeing my dad having achieved in, in his life, uh, and he wouldn't tell you, like he, he was so, um, intensely humble at his core, you know, he would never tell you that he came from nothing and, and achieved something. Right. And he was always very risk averse, you know, that I think that was just part of, you know, coming from the circumstances he did and, you know, his parents having come out of the great depression. Um, and so my, my dad wouldn't have been an entrepreneur. He definitely taught us by example, how to achieve. And so, um, I have 100%, you know, tried to embody those sorts of, um, things that, that, uh, I learned from my dad from a young age that you can, there's always room for improvement. There's always the possibility, right? Um, you can always figure out a way to raise yourself and others to greater heights. Uh, unequivocally, those are things that I draw upon, you know, um, being an entrepreneur, being a, a CEO, um, it's not an easy journey. Um, and there are very lonely moments at times, right? And so sometimes in those lonely moments, when you're sitting with your own thoughts, um, I draw back to some of those lessons and, and remember where my family's come from, where my dad came from, where I've come from, right? And, and um, that it's just one, one foot in front of the other. You just, you keep going, you keep, you know, um, going up those stairs one by one um, and keep achieving what you want to achieve. So, I mean, if you think about it, if you combine kindness and compassion, love with hard work and dedication and a belief that of continuous improvement and that you can improve. That's not a lot more than you need in life. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty darn good recipe right there. Those are pretty good founding principles. I would say. Yeah. yeah. You talk a lot about authenticity too, and you have this authentic family story of where you come from that's framed you and who you are and who your kids now are. Uh, what do you think the key to living an authentic life is? Uh, I, I, I think, you know, really just making a, an internal commitment, a purposeful, intentional commitment that um, I will be true to who I say that I am and, and the word that I give, right? Particularly in business when, when it, and, and in life too. I mean, your interpersonal relationships, you know, for your partner, your life partner, your spouse, for your kids to be able to trust you, they need to be able to trust your word. You know, when, when you say something, you damn well better, you know, fulfill on that because if not, all you do is, is create a breakdown of trust that then they're continually second guessing you all the time. The same goes for business, right? If you're a significant business leader and you're leading other leaders and you're leading teams, right? And you are engaging with the community and partners and vendors. If you are not who you say you are and you do not fulfill on the things that you say you do, you will constantly have people second guessing you around you um, and they will never give you a hundred percent of what they can or need to give in order to, to, to bring about this, the success you need. The same goes for your family, your kids, you know, to help them get where you, where you want them to go. Um, they need to trust you as a guide. And so, yes, I, I think that, um, uh, again, it's, it just starts with, um, being intentional, making a commitment and saying, this is, this is what I'm going to be and who I'm going to be. And I'm going to make sure, and, and look, we all make mistakes. We all say things in a moment where, um, you know, a moment of, uh, emotion or passion, but for the most part, if, if we can, um, if you can slow down enough to say, 
I will make sure that my word aligns with my deed and that who I profess to be is who I am uh, and that I true that up all the time, right? Um, there's always gaps. There's always gaps, right? But little by little, um, you know, you slow down enough to make sure that the, the things that you're telling your family, the things that you're telling your, your team, that, that they're true um, and that you will fulfill upon those things, right? Um, that's been a great strength and something, yeah, definitely I, I drew from my dad, but um, I would say part of who I am and part of the, the success that I've been able to create and see is by making sure that those around me know that they don't have to second guess me. What kind of relationship did you have with your mom and what things did she teach you? We've talked about your dad quite a bit. What, what, what's your mom famous for in your life kind of a thing? My mom's an angel and um, certainly my dad is uh, the man he is because of my mom. Um, my, my dad was on a very different path when he met my mom. Uh, you know, having come from a kind of a rough town, rough upbringing, um, uh, candidly, you know, from alcoholic parents. Um, when my dad met my mom, his life was on a very different path and um, he really liked my mom. They went out on a date um, and he took her home and he said, hey, I really want to go out with you again. Um, and she said, well, go clean up, um, stop drinking, stop smoking, and then maybe I'll, I'll go out with you again. So um, over, I, I forget the time period, it was six or nine months, you know, my dad, so he could go out with my mom again, you know, um, he, he went and cleaned up and uh, came back and knocked on her door and said, hey, I'm, you know, I, I, I got rid of my habits. Um, I'd love to take you out. And so she went out with him again and, you know, ultimately they, they end up married. Um, my mom was, uh, kind of the, the stability, you know, in the home, she was the nurturer, definitely a more, um, you know, of that generation, a more traditional motherly role, um, mostly at home. Um, you know, by the time we got a little bit older, she, she picked up some odd jobs or she had, um, in the home for a long time, she had a ceramic studio, you know, and, she, and ladies from the neighborhood would all come over and, and paint ceramics together. And, you know, they would, um, uh, gossip about all the things going on in the neighborhood and all that kind of stuff. Right. You could always count on my mom uh, and my mom, my mom, her work ethic. Oh my gosh. Even today, you know, at uh, 80 ish years old, right. She, she goes and goes and goes and goes. She goes more than I do at 80 and I'm 47. Right. We could always count on her. She would be up early. Breakfast would be on the table. You know, we'd have sack lunches ready to go to lunch, uh, ready to go to school. Um, you know, dinner was always, you know, there and, and, and a warm meal. And I'm not saying that this has to be, you know, a, 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 a female role. I'm just saying that it was a very comforting thing as a kid. You, you knew you could count on, right? Um, um, she was very nurturing. Um, she, but she's also, you know, came from a generation where, you know, not a lot of real openness and vulnerability and that type of stuff. You know, um, uh, I think she knew she needed to be the stalwart. My, again, my dad was busy. He was very busy. Uh, and so when dad wasn't around, we knew, you know, uh, we knew mom had our backs and we knew we could always count on her. Um, you know, and, and again, those things of kindness and compassion, um, it, you know, my, my dad owes a lot of that to my mom too. You know, she was the one behind the scenes orchestrating and saying, you know, such and such neighbor or family member has a need and what are we going to do about that? Right. Um, and so then, you know, my dad would get on board and go help her with that, with that kind of stuff. And that's still very much the case today, you know. Um, uh, and it's interesting as we interact with them and, uh, you know, they still continue to tell us about, you know, um, and, and humbly, but just tell us about other people's needs, right, and what they've done, you know, to, to help with that stuff. If I were to ask you what a defining fatherhood moment in your fatherhood journey has been, what would that be? As my oldest two sons were... were um, transitioning into their teenage years and really starting to test the boundaries, right? Um, and really starting to test my patience. I had tried so hard, you know, for so long to like be the staunch fatherly figure who was going to obligate them to do the things that, you know, um, the, the way that I thought they should be done. And I think finally just coming to that realization of they're individuals, <laughs> they are their own people. Um, and there is, it doesn't matter what measure, of punishment, of reward, of whatever sort of psychological or physical mechanism that you try to use, they're going to do whatever the damn well they please to do, right? And so I just need to um, be here as a guide, right? Um, I need to be here uh, to show them strength, to show them the way that I would um, live, and certainly to, to coach and to guide them, but 
just step back from the emotion. You know, we, we have to do that in business all the time, right? Um, we face very emotional moments in business. Um, and I think that the best leaders learn, you know, through high emotional intelligence to uh, quickly step back from the emotions of the moment and say, okay, what do we need to do to create the right outcomes, you know, here? Um, and how do I become a guide to do that? And so I, I think coming to that realization in my kid's life of when things go terribly awry, I'm going to step back from the emotions and I'm just going to talk, you know, very candidly about, um, you know, here's, here's what happened. Here's what went, went wrong or what do you think went wrong? Right. Um, what did we learn, you know, from this, this experience and here's some other things, you know, some other things I would offer learnings, right. Um, things you can count on in life and things that you might want to adjust or shift for future moments in life. Um, when you're faced with similar decisions, right. So you can create better outcomes for yourself. Um, so I, I, I feel like, you know, that's probably um, the biggest realization. And, and candidly, um, my relationship with my kids significantly improved from that moment forward. Mm. Um, you know, when, when I stopped trying to be the, the forceful father figure and, and uh, I decided that, you know, you're your own individuals. You're going to live your life. I'm here to be a guide. So my question on that is, was that when you had that realization, was that a conversation you had in your own head or was that actually a conversation you had with your kids? Uh, in my own head. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was just, you know, bumping my head against the wall, um, kind of time and time again. And, you know, I, I always go back to uh, Einstein's definition of, of insanity, right? It's, it's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. So um, in life and in business, when I find myself in that repetitive sort of cycle of I've done this four times and, you know, and it's the exact same result every single time. And it's not the result I want. Right. Um, let me back up. Let me think about this and, and figure out how I, how I adjust and how I shift, um, to, you know, to create, um, the right outcomes. And so, yes, it was, it was a personal moment of, you know, me in my own mind and finally going, okay, why don't, why don't I try this out? At least, uh, you know, I can't, I can't lose cause I'm not exactly winning right now. So, uh, <laughs> let me, let me try this out and see how it goes. And I would say it's been a, you know, whether or not it's the right approach for everybody, you know, um, that's, their own personal decision to make. But for me and my kids, it seems to have worked far better. I think I'm having a personal aha moment as we sit here. <clears throat> so we went to Cornell with all of our executives at our company a couple of weeks ago and did a leadership training. And they talked about how to develop your people, right? Develop your associates as a leader, best practices of how to do that. And they said, you know, directing doesn't work. Meaning when you say, go do this, which I do with my kids today, right? I try not to, but I do. I'm like a somewhat big personality at home. And I'm like, kids, this is what you need to do. Why didn't you do it this way? Pick this right friend, go do this, whatever, right? Which is exact opposite of what they told us to do with our business people and associates at, at Cornell. So maybe this will be helpful for some people. To your point, you said guide and coach, right? You, yep. And I think as parents, we do this at work too, but I do it worse quite frankly, at home is I direct my kids, go do this. And they said, don't do that. Go to, go to your associates. And in this case, our kids and say, well, and ask questions like you mentioned, right? Ask questions like, well, what do you think the outcome of that decision might be? Or, Hey, you know, they say, Hey, I want to do this dad. Well, what are three choices? Come back to me with three ways you could go about handling this. You know, you, our job is to teach them to grow and learn and become adults, right? Not, they can't do that if we direct them. And so I'm having my own aha moment right now that I need to really change the wit, what I'm doing at home and start asking more questions and let them figure out life on their own as me, as a guide, like you said it, or as a coach, not as a parent directing them what they ought to do because I know better. Yeah. Well, they're never going to learn or grow if they, if we do that. So I'm so glad you said that because it kind of took my, what I'm learning in business and said, knock me across the face and said, do it better at home. So for those listening, I think if we can ask questions, if we can say, well, what do you think the outcome will be? Or what do you think your choices are? Or, you know, how might that affect you? Or, you know, whatever, just ask questions. Usually our kids are super smart. Mm -hmm. And if they can, if you can walk them through the future in their own mind, they're probably going to come up with a good solution and maybe better than we would on our own. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the hope is that uh, each generation, you know, uh, kind of improves and evolves, you know, a little bit. Right. And I think you're so right, Corey. Um, and, and that for me was really, I, I kind of, I had this moment where I said, um, 
I'm incongruent with who I am in business and, and at home, right? Um, I try to be this authoritative figure at home, but in business, uh, you know, I, I very much try to have this guide sort of guide code, uh, excuse me, guide approach. And so, um, yes, it, it, it worked way better for me to like true those two things up and become authentic, uh, throughout my life and in those, in, in those different roles, right. In that one kind of principle. In some of the answers that you've given today to our questions, I've noticed the vocabulary that you've used. And a lot of those have come up in books that I've read. Are you, do you like to read? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm a voracious learner. Um, as, a, okay. as a leader, you always have to be learning, right? And so whether it's books or podcasts or uh, peer groups or mentorship, you know, advisors, uh, yes, absolutely. So here's my question. What are your top two books right now? Um, I would say um, my my top two books of all time. Um, I really, really like Winner's Dream by Bill McDermott. He has been co-CEO of, uh, of SAP, of course, the company that acquired, you know, here in Utah, uh, Qualtrics, and then, you know, spun it off um, for IPO. Uh, I, I really resonated with Bill's story just because he grew up kind of blue collar, you know, neighborhood, um, if I remember, in the suburbs of Pennsylvania or New York, and, and then, you know, worked his way up, you know, uh, again, these principles we've been talking about today, hard, you know, hard and smart work, and actually a very compassionate leader, uh, Bill McDermott, um, and, you know, worked his way to a global CEO of, a, of one of the world's largest, you know, software companies. Uh, so that book um, definitely has always been, uh, you know, one of the, one of my favorites, one that I very much resonated with. Um, in terms of you know, as a business leader, as an entrepreneur, one of the epiphanies I, I had to have in business was that um, if you are not a marketing and sales organization first, you are not a growth organization, right? Um, and so the book uh, Fanatical Prospecting by Jeb Blunt um, was always, um, uh, you know, has always been uh, very much a, an important part of my journey as an entrepreneur. And I'm going to cheat. My third would be Extreme Ownership um, by Jocko Willink. Um, that, that made a massive shift in who I am as a, le a leader and the way that I view leadership. Um, and I would say has, you know, made me a significantly more effective leader. Yeah. Great books. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for sharing those with us. Of course. You know, for, for me, I think the, the, maybe the, the other greatest shift or epiphany I've had, um, in recent years is to just really be present and savor the moments. Um, that can be so hard as a busy entrepreneur executive um you know you're like when you're with the family you know you've got eighty three thousand emails coming in and people you know peeing you like crazy on text or w whatever right it's the onslaught is non-stop as a leader it makes it really challenging to like really just disconnect and be with the you know be with the family and and um honor those moments you know uh, and so, um, not that I didn't know this before, it's just particularly as my kids have, you know, become more adults and actually the time, the quality time is, I think, better than it's ever been before. We're just able to engage on a different level, you know, as, as kind of, uh, eye to eye adults, you know, different phases in our journey, but, um, but, you know, me really making a, a more intentional effort to say, okay, the phone is going off, right. At least for a couple of hours, um, or it's going to go off for the most of a, a you know, a week or 10 day vacation or whatever. Right. Um, and, and I'm going to be present in these moments and I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy, um, these moments, enjoy who my kids are, enjoy the individual and, and let them celebrate the individuals they are, let them be those individuals, right. They're each unique and they should be, um, you know, for me, variety is the spice of life. It's what brings the vibrance. Right. Um, and, uh, I, I very much believe that we should all, you know, be our own individuals as a parent, it can be challenging to actually like to actually parent that way. Right. I'm focusing more on, um, celebrating the unique individuals that my, my kids are appreciating and honoring that and supporting them that. Yeah. And I think you, you, you said leaders and CEOs and executives have this challenge. I don't think it's exclusive to that group of people because even if you just open your phone, your phone will send you 300 notifications a day that are just trying to get your attention to get you away from the present moment. And that can come without any responsibilities in business. Uh, that comes to all of us and we all have to figure out how to be present in the moment. And I think it's something that we've all struggled with. Uh, 
I know I have. Which, by the way, one of my hacks is I, I have all of my notifications off on my phone and my computer. Um, I only allow notifications from a few individuals, you know, my kids, my wife, uh, and a few executives that I know if, if they reach out with a, you know, an urgent risk request, I need to get to them, right? Um, outside of that, that way I control when and where I engage with what I engage with because the, the, the other stuff can be such a time suck, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you allow it to be and, and those constant notifications, like for me, it, they created massive anxiety for a while. I was like, I, I just got to shut all this off. There's no reason to engage with it. Um, so yeah, go ahead. Do it, do it on your time schedule. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Love it. So one of the things I thought I ask is you've been married four years now and you mentioned a blended family now, right? So maybe we should ask a little bit about that. I mean, um, not everyone experiences that. Do you have advice for those who are considering a blended family or, or in the midst of that, um, lessons learned or things that worked, you know, that kind of thing? Yeah. I guess the things that I've learned is, first of all, um, a blended family is rarely the, the Brady Bunch, right? Um, um, you know, life is sticky. It's challenging. It's difficult. Interpersonal relationships amplify that, right? Um, and particularly when you, you create more interpersonal relationships in a family dynamic, don't get me wrong, you know, having a blended family has enriched our lives. It's uh, enriched our relationships and, and, um, we've learned a lot from each other. Um, we've also had some struggles, right? Um, I would say I, I have to hand it to the kids in terms of their relationships with each other. There's never been, um, our kids have never had problems with each other. There's never been fights with each other. Um, they also, you know, just kind of kept their, they, they were all either adults going into adulthood or, you know, teenagers and they just kind of, you know, kept to their own space. Right. Um, it's not like they were hanging out all the time and stuff. Although we would get these glimpses of, um, they would engage with each other a lot more, uh, at school and in social media than they would actually at home. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, uh, some of the challenges we faced have, have been more the adults, um, towards the kids or the kids towards the adults. Right. Um, and so again, I think for me, one of the biggest lessons I had to learn is, is these are their own unique individuals. Um, and I need to let them be their own unique individuals. They don't need to fit inside my box or, you know, the, the, the specific box that I might define for my family. Honestly, again, that's, that's created massive shifts. Um, my relationship with, with my stepdaughter, you know, has, has significantly improved in the, in the past 12 months or 18 months, uh, by both of us focusing enough to give each other the space to be who we are, to honor that and to be respectful of each other. Right. So a a blended family is rarely, I think very, very easy, but it can be significantly rewarding and it can be a a beautiful thing to bring those people together. You know, um, when we were just a couple of weeks ago, you know, in Costa Rica as, you know, at least part of us as a blended family, a couple of the kids couldn't go uh, because of work commitments and stuff, but you know, to see them engage in each other with each other in that space. And then like, you know, one night, you know, we had music on, you know, we, we just all got silly and we're dancing and, uh, you know, for a good while, a couple hours, you know, just having a good time to see now, you know, that they're proud to introduce, introduce each other as this is my you know, stepbrother and my stepsister, and this is my, you know, my stepdad, and this is my, you know, we're, we're, we're proud to be family. Um, I would say it took some time to get there. It took some time, you know, there, there were some struggles early on it, just to see those, those relationships evolve and improve has been very rewarding, particularly when you have the time to step away and really focus and look at them. If you gave a short message to your kids, if they happen to listen to this podcast, is there anything you want to say to your kids? Um, be true to who they are, be true to their heart, um, and be good people, you know, do the right things and do them for the right reasons and, um, dream, dream big and follow those dreams. You know, I think those would be my biggest pieces of, of, of advice. Awesome. That's good advice. Okay. Well, we have, uh, the question we ask everyone, which is what does it mean to you to be a gentleman? I know we've spent a lot of time talking about my dad this, this hour, right? Um, that was the, the reference point for the, the conversation. Um, but, but I want to kind of close going back to um, thinking about my, my father. For me, my dad was the quintessential embodiment of a gentleman. And I very much try to, um, to be that same type of man, right? My dad was graceful. He was elegant. He was charismatic. Not was, he is, I should say because he's still with us. My dad, again, has always deeply cared about people 
and he's made that very, very prevalent, very well known, you know, um, not, not by him saying it, but just by the way he treats people and by the example that, that he gives. Uh, my dad treated my mom with, with the utmost greatest respect. My dad has always loved my mom deeply, deeply, um, and has always taken care of her. That's one thing he's been always very public about expressing um, in the family, you know, in, in business, in other, you know, roles in life. He's always been very public about expressing the way he feels about my mom and, and his deep level of appreciation for her, right? For me, a, a gentleman, you know, is, is a strong man who is true to their word and, and um, a strong man who is true to who they profess to be. Uh, somebody who lifts others up, who leaves a legacy of good in their wake. I think that's a, that's a gentleman. Life is challenging again. Life is hard. Business can be hard. Um, we all face defining moments that test the resolve of our character as individuals um, and our integrity. The people that I would call real gentlemen are people that don't allow those moments to define them in a negative way. They, they use those moments as a catalyst to reaffirm who they are at their core and to figure out how to do good and produce the right outcomes for, for others, and including themselves, right, in those experiences. Earl, thank you for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to get to know you better. It's been a pleasure to get to know Gary, your dad, and hear you talk about your angel mother and your kids. I got a lot of value out of today's conversation and hopefully those listening did as well. If people want to connect with you, where do they find you? And you've got a podcast as well. If you'd like to do a plug for your podcast, get over there and listen to Earl's podcast as well. Yeah. Thank you so much again, gentlemen, for the invitation today. This has been a fantastic hour to sit down and have this conversation with you and certainly been a, quite the opportunity for me to reflect on a lot of really important you know, uh, principles in life as well. The best way to connect with me is LinkedIn. Um, uh, I'm quite vocal and, and uh, present on, on LinkedIn. Connect with me there. Uh, the podcast is called Tech Beat, where leaders learn, innovate, and grow. Um, and definitely we would, would appreciate your support. Go subscribe. We're on all major podcast platforms. I bring founders, leaders, um, on to share their journey. I like, like you gentlemen, um, I think there's so much value in understanding the journey and the story of the life behind the leader that you see. And, uh, so that's really, you know, kind of the focus of what tech beat is, is to highlight those stories and then the greatest lessons they've learned in life and business. Um, and to share those with the community and the ecosystem so that we can buoy it up and, and help each other thrive. That's kind of the mission behind, and, and my podcast, is, it, for me, it's a, it's a give back. It's um, how, do I, how do I contribute to the local or you know, even national ecosystem of, of entrepreneurship and leadership um, and provide some, some really good content and thought that might you know, help others hack their journeys, right? Cool. So, yeah, thank you. Earl Foot, thanks for joining us today. If you haven't liked and subscribed to the Gentleman Project podcast, please do so. I'm Kirk Chug. And I'm Corey Moore. Have a great week. 